Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Storytime. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest on today's episode is one unlike any other guest that I've had on the show. His name is Chris Cox. He is a mentalist. Um, and I will let him explain what exactly that is. But long story short, um, I worked with him and got to know him when uh, him and his the rest of his show had a residency in Reno. And he is so amazing. His talents are mind blowing. So you'll have to wait and hear his story and what exactly he does. Um, but I hope you love his episode as much as I do. everyone welcome back I am here with one of my friends and one of the most amazing people and most talented people that I know Chris Cox how are you I really thought you were going to say someone else's name there I was like surely this can't be me <laughs> you are one of the few people that has like legit blown my mind so you get that <laughs> so I Very wanted kind. to of course so you like to say that you are the mind reader that can't read minds explain to everyone what that means okay so i uh i'm basically like every other mind reader but just a lot more honest um i don't believe anyone can read your mind i personally don't believe uh, anyone is really psychic or anything like that yet what i know i can do with the skills of magic and psychology and body language and influencing and devilish good looks and obviously lying um is i can make you think that i know what you're thinking so I am very honest that I cannot read your mind, but you will see me do what I do and be like, well, surely this guy can read my mind. And that's kind of the joy of it for me is that fun little gray area between not being able to do it, but making it look like I can do it. It just makes it fun. Yeah, it's insane. And I mean, you know, I've seen the show or I saw the show in Reno a million times and every single time the people's reactions and even my reaction, I'm like, how did he know that? So it's insane. And I want to start off before we talk about you and your career in your life, just the state of live entertainment right now. Cause I know I was talking to one of your former cast members, one of the other illusionists, just kind of throughout COVID. And they were saying how hard it was for them in the States, but for you back home in London, not able to really do shows and having a career that you rely on being able to see people. How has it been for you the past several months? Oh, it's been pretty rubbish. Um, but, uh, you know, it, there, there's a joy in the fact that it's been pretty rubbish for everyone. I think it's so weird how the entertainment industry has been specifically very hardly, very, um, very hard hit by this. And, you know, even it's often, you know, magicians are very good at adapting. So it'd be like, okay, well, if there's no stage work at the minute, because there's not much gigs, then maybe I'll do corporate work or close-up work or kids parties or something. But suddenly, like all of those things and all of the areas where you might do stuff, like events and stuff, they just don't exist at the minute in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. We are currently in another lockdown at the minute. So even though theatres were slowly starting to open, all of that's been shut down again. Um, and it's kind of, you know, it's crazy in that I look at it and go, literally a year ago today, I was in New York about to star on Broadway. Um, I was in the middle of a US tour uh, and that got cancelled halfway through and I got flown home at the start of the pandemic in March. We had the rest of a year planned out. It's all been stopped and people know that. Um, but it's, you know, we're constantly hoping that uh, as and when stuff comes back, it will be sooner rather than later and people will have a thirst for live entertainment. And, you know, it's it's interesting now starting to think creatively about, well, how do I do what I do within this world can i still have people on stage can they be near me if they wear a mask can i look at the cues that i'm looking for in their face to be able to read their mind um mm -hmm. can i touch them and read their mind which is one of my big things is i make a connection with people and i can read my mind all of that suddenly you're having to rethink about everything and you know there's a creative challenge within that but also a depressing kind of state of going all right well what i was doing i'd spent my life working on and creating and people loved it and now i'm I'm, I'm just not allowed to do it. There is no place I'm allowed to do what I've spent my life training to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I apart know from people, virtually. Yeah, I was going to ask. I've seen all over your social. It looks like you're now doing virtual mind reading. How is that working? You know what? It's uh, fun and soul destroying at the exact same time <laughs> because it's really nice to have a connection with people. And I've developed all these effects and tricks that work through Zoom and I can interact with people and blow their minds. Um, but equally, it makes me sad for what 
what there was and you know I'll say lines that I say on stage and know where all the beats and the pauses are for the laughs and go oh yeah I, I don't get that this way but um people have been really enjoying them I've spent a lot of time working on it and I'm constantly you know at the minute I'm just doing uh private shows that people can book me for for like company Christmas parties and stuff like that um but I'm then taking all those ideas and working on them and hopefully we'll have a kind of public show as well uh, early next year um but it's kind of been a fun challenge but one I'd avoided for a while because I kept thinking oh well stage stuff will come back soon and that ain't happening anytime soon I don't think anybody could have seen in March because I was going to go see you in Phoenix on tour yeah. I think two weeks before the yes. shutdown, I think. Yeah, and then... we were literally shut down just, uh, we shut down and we were about to have a week off and then we were going to come back to um, somewhere near San Francisco and then come down to Phoenix, Arizona. And that was going to be like, also like just in terms of, you know, we had a very, we started the tour in January in Buffalo um, and it had been a hard slog of tours. It had been lots of one-nighters, it had been a lot of middle America and it had been very snowy and cold and, you know, it was a constant slog. And, um, and then we were just getting to the point where it was going to be Arizona and California and we were doing two or three nights and we'd have time off and we were going to do the Dolby Theatre and it was all going to be the nice part of the tour that we'd worked really hard to get towards and then it was all, all sacked off, as we say. Insane. Well, hopefully it all gets rescheduled and you can come back and enjoy the t-shirts and shorts weather. And I know people, like you said, will be craving that live entertainment. Um, so hopefully that happens again soon. And I want to know, you said you've worked your whole life perfecting your craft and your act and all of that. So how did you start? Like what age were you? Were you like, all right, I want to read minds for a career. Um, so I remember it very well. I was at home uh, in England where I live and I was 11 years old and I got a letter uh, that was delivered by an owl and then seven years at Hogwarts, Hufflepuff and Proud and then Mind Reader. Um, that, how much I wish that were real. Uh, the boring real answer is I got a magic kit for Christmas when I was about six years old and just always loved magic and always loved performing and always loved theatre and just kept doing them. And I did psychology at school and realised if I mixed that with magic, it looked like mind reading. And then um, there's a huge international festival called the Edinburgh Fringe Festival where there's like 2000 shows take place. And, and when I was at university, I saved up my student loan um, and went and did a show at Edinburgh, which went quite well. And then I went back another year and just, just kept doing it. And I was young enough and stupid enough to not have any fear and just be like, all right, well, I'll do another show and I'll, people seem to come and I keep working on it. And then, you know, in the last few years, I've been lucky enough to be picked to be in the illusionists and it's the closest you could get to having a day job as a magician. And I get to travel the world and play these amazing stages and, meet people around the world and have friends like you all around in different parts of the world and you know get to go out and, and make people laugh and amaze them and capture childlike wonder and it's um yeah it's uh, you know it's a very privileged thing to be able to do and is certainly the one of the things I've learned from the ongoing pandemic uh is how much I miss that and how much of an important part of my soul that is um and actually feeling like which, feeling like I took stuff for granted when I probably necessarily didn't but it, you know it was a incredible but it is a it is your job so you know it's amazing that my job was in New York going to do a show on Broadway and in Reno getting up every day going to do the show at the Eldorado or at Sydney Opera House um but mm -hmm. it quickly becomes oh well that's just me going to the office mm -hmm. um uh but uh oh my god I'll never take that for granted again yeah, and speaking of just every show you've done, I have your resume here because I'm like, there's so much I'm not going to be able to memorize this. I mean, like you said, Illusionist, Broadway. We're going to stop there. I can't even imagine how it is to be a performer on Broadway. Like, what was your reaction when the Illusionist first asked you to do that show? And then how amazing was it to perform every night? Um, my reaction was constant fear until I was on the flight to New York in that that someone's going to find me out and be like actually we should get someone good um uh it was a constant like, oh, like the poster came out I'm like oh, okay that's good and then another poster I'm like okay that's all right and then they did a photo shoot I was like oh, okay that's all right and then I start you know creating bits for the act and like working out how to make it Christmassy and I was like oh great um so uh but also like you know it was incredible and the I you know my greatest love is theatre. I love it. And, you know, when I would regularly take trips from London to New York to see shows, I went out and saw like Hamilton when it opened. And weirdly, my first ever trip to New York when I was 21, the first show I saw on Broadway was Hairspray, which was at the Neil Simon Theatre. And then I was doing this show at the Neil Simon Theatre. Oh um, was amazing. And just like getting to live in New York for seven weeks 
was mm-hmm. phenomenal. Like just, you know, I literally, I think about it so much at the minute because this time last year I was there, but like I put my mm-hmm. coat on, I'd go downstairs, I'd be out on the streets, I'd walk through Times Square, I'd try and cut past the crowds at Rockefeller. <laughs> um, I'd, like, I'd be like, oh look, there's me on a billboard. I'd like walk into the show, I'd put my head down so no one saw me. And I, mm-hmm. like all those, all those things, you just, you know, it's A, doing the show on Broadway is phenomenal, but equally it's, it's just doing the show in another room, but it felt mm-hmm. super special. But also just the whole, you know, being in New York, uh, that amazing city, that energy, that, you know, mm-hmm. there's, there, were, there was a week where we did 16 shows in five days. It was three a day and it was just, you know, it literally lived, you go to bed, get up, get to the theater, do the shows, go to bed, get up. And, but, mm-hmm. oh my God, I, to go back and do that would be amazing. And just like to know that, you know, there's people sat in that audience who this might be their first time at seeing a show and they'll hopefully see another show because they enjoyed ours. It's always, you know, it's truly, you know, a dream come true. And, I remember worrying, spending a lot of my time being anxious out there going, oh, what if I, what if this doesn't ever happen? This could be it for me. This is it. And, you know, weirdly at the minute, it feels like that, but I kind of wish I'd enjoyed it more, but Mm -hmm. hope very much that one day I'll get to do it again. And Christmas time in New York City is just on the bucket list for me. That's something where you see it in the movies and it just seems like the best time of the year to be there and I think you had your family with you right for a little yeah. bit there so how was yeah. that that was great it was so good I'd had um just had my second uh child just before Broadway so luckily mm-hmm. she arrived early which meant I had a couple of weeks at home with her before I had to go and then I was in New York mm-hmm. for a couple of weeks and then they came out as soon as her passport was ready um mm-hmm. so we spent Christmas in New York and uh so I had a kind of brand new born who's a couple of weeks old and then Emery was just turned two um mm-hmm. So it was, you know, and it was a weird, when they first got there, I had a few days off, which was nice. So we spent a lot of time doing stuff. And then it was juggling between being able to do things with them and doing the job and going and doing the show. But they would come backstage and I'd see them and, you know, they'd stand in the wings and we'd hang out in the dressing room and we'd meet in Central Park between shows and all those things. And, you know, it's just, um, New York at Christmas is cold and crazy and super busy, but full of energy and excitement and feels like the center of the world. And, you know, to be part of that community, doing you know knowing that you know i occasionally like at, we do we do 11 a.m shows and i would you know at 10 30 be walking with a starbucks and a bagel into the theater and mm. there'd be a queue of people waiting to see the show and you know to know you're part of their holiday plans and their excitement is yeah. you know it's it's incredible there's nothing like it that's so special and i know um i'm a huge hamilton fan and so i've watched a ton of videos and just the lines outside are crazy so i can only imagine how you felt as an actual like cast member in a Broadway show and just seeing people line up for you. Like you said, seeing the billboard with your face on it. Um, yeah, it's l- like literally, I remember walking through Times Square and just being like, oh, that's me. <laughs> and like, it's just nuts. Um, and like, on my first day in New York, it's like, oh, there's a taxi, oh, I'm on the taxi. And there's a hot dog cart, I'm on the hot dog cart. And it's, you know, it's, you know, the photos I'll cherish for the rest of my life. And also that thing of like, when you'd finish a show and there'd be outside stage door people would want you to sign their playbills and you're kind of like really okay this is weird and then suddenly you're like oh this is amazing um and yeah. also i got to perform hamilton on broadway um because i do a routine you know it's called control chris cox people think of things they want me to do i do what they're thinking of and one night someone was thinking of me singing hamilton so i can say i performed hamilton on broadway i wasn't in hamilton Ooh. i just i just did some words what song did you do I did. Um, I did my shot. So I went, uh, I'm going to get a scholarship to King's College. I probably shouldn't brag, but dag, I am amazed and astonished. The problem is I've got a lot of brain spot, but no polish. I got a holler just to be heard with every word I drop knowledge. I'm a dummy in the rough and shiny piece of cold trying to reach my goal. My power of speech unimpeachable. Only 19, but my mind is older. These New York City streets get colder. I shoulder every bird and every disadvantage. I had learned to manage. I don't have a gun to British. I walk these streets famished. I could keep going, but we'll, we'll get bored. You probably think I had you on fast forward just now. That was that, so that was, fast. That was like... real speed. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And like you said, with all the posters and stuff, I'm looking at the one behind you from the Reno. Oh, yes. I think that's the, that's, no, that's yeah, not Yeah, Reno's that one there. Reno's so at the I end. St- I remember seeing you on buses all the time, that giant sign on the El Dorado. And when you come out to the ballpark, you guys had the video board ad and it's just so crazy. And when you guys left, um, cause they didn't replace your picture with Wes's when you yes. left. So it was still you. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, I miss them so much. Like you said, the joy that you bring people is just so amazing. It's something that not a lot of careers and professions can do. So with that, was there one memory? And I know you have so many different experiences that I'm sure you have a ton of memories, but one that stands out where you're like, okay, I know this person is going to remember 
this moment for the rest of their life and something that really touched you as a performer? Yeah, there's a few. It's weird because, you know, I, I'm so privileged and lucky to do what I do. And it's weird how they, everything just kind of fall, you know, it can be an amazing moment for someone, but it's just another show for me, um, which feels trite to say that but it, it kind of is and you know my job is I'm good at what I do so I can create those things and every now and again something will pop forward there's a photo I have um weirdly I was lucky that a friend was in watching the show that night and took some photos during the show in New York where I had this mother and a son who were up in the balcony mm -hmm. and like I just I was on I, like, some nights I feel like I'm on fire and I'm like this is just and their reactions were just like like earth shattering like beliefs like their whole belief systems collapsing around them and seeing mm -hmm. them interact and then having a moment to make them feel more connected as a son and a mother was so special and like knowing that I'm creating those moments where hopefully people will remember it for a long time and kind of showing the power of the human mind and the enjoyment we can get out of life um and just seeing those yeah having those points and often sometimes I'll just take a guess at something and watch someone's jaw drop and be like oh wow okay I'm sort of surprised myself with that mm -hmm. um it's always uh yeah it is always a you know those moments often they're um just they fly by but every now and again there'll be one way it'll properly stick with me like if I get someone up for my dressing room routine where I have someone on stage with me like most of the time I go through the same routine every now and again I get what I call a live wire up who's someone who just is a very big personality and it allows me to be like all right well let's see what's going to happen here those mm -hmm. moments always stick with me um, when it kind of goes in weird directions. And I feel like there was a lot of that in Reno because it's Reno. People, yes, a lot of crazies. Yeah, lots of different characters every single show. So I remember there were some skeptics and then you did your act and they were like, oh my God, like they felt stupid for even like, thinking that it couldn't be a thing so well that's part of the joy of it you kind of I'm very unassuming and sort of weird my characters kind of you sort of think I'm gonna suck um uh um but also you know you got to see that show a lot of times you poor poor person but you see the the, the bits which are similar every night and the bits that are different every night and like the mm -hmm. structure that's there and then everything else is kind of loosely you bounce off that structure and you see things which you know it's constantly different it's you know the the biggest frustration I find as a performer is when people go oh well it's just set up he must just pick people he knows it's like well a I do as much as I can in the show to prove that's not the case because we constantly pick people at random but also why would we bother that's just yeah. a play then you know we are magicians of course I can't read the minds but I can make you think I can and that's what I'm doing and mm -hmm. come see the show again you'll see different people you'll get different reactions it will change um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's always a frustration, but kind of part of the, the annoyance of doing it is people will always be looking for a, an answer or a, mm -hmm. a kind of a way to fight down at what they're doing. Yeah, and I can just back that up. I, it was my Sunday routine to go see The Illusionist. Like, even after Aces games, I would go right to the show. It was just a fun way to chill. And I will say, every show is very different. So for anybody listening to this, it's like, I don't know, like it's the same thing over and over. I can promise you it's not, it's amazing, especially with Chris's act. Um, I mean, you just got something different every time. And in the beginning, you brought up the Harry Potter reference and I have, I want to screw this up. So it's, you were the magic and illusions assistant for the West End's Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. How, Parts one and two. how awesome was that? Like, I think it that'd be a great. dream come true for me. It was so good. Uh, I loved, I loved working on that show. And I, you know, I was lucky that I saw that show and was a fan of that show. And then I was asked to come and work on it. Um, and it is uh, an incredible piece of theatre. And um, I was taken and brought on board with the team and trained up for new cast and helped do the tricks and then would watch the show and tell them what was good and what was bad and fix things and note the show. Um, mm -hmm. And it was great to kind of exercise a different part of my brain and be part of that world of magic and see you know it's very different to what I do I always it's funny a lot of the cast came to see the show The Illusionist when I was doing it in the West End mm -hmm. and I always feel a bit like a fraud compared to them because I sort of go out with the words that I've written and it's always different every night based on how people respond and stuff um mm -hmm. yet weirdly they said to me they feel like frauds because they're just going out with words that have written for that been written for them and they just do the same thing every night and it's funny mm -hmm. to see those two you know we are but we are all stage uh, people who are on stage but I am very much a performer and they are very much actors and there is a huge mm -hmm. difference between those two things and it's funny that they thought of themselves as frauds and me thought I, was, I couldn't go out and you know say the exact same words every night in the same way and feel that emotion and make people 
do that and they go well I couldn't go out and make it up and yeah it's funny so for people that haven't heard of the illusionists like you said there's so many different types of illusionists and magicians and all of that so how if you could describe for everybody how is your act and what you focus on different than maybe I mean I'm just gonna do the Reno cast like a magic Dave or a Krendel um or Hunjun like how is everything different just so when the show does come back people know what to expect so uh, you know there are lots of different parts of magic within the world of magic there's illusions there's escapology there's comedy magic there's card tricks there's uh, mind reading which is what i do um and in the illusions we have different acts who have different specialities so i come on and i read minds and i am the mind reader uh and i kind of do that in as a funny entertaining silly enjoyable ridiculous way as possible um where you have someone like uh hun jun kim who is uh from south korea who's an incredible manipulator and he does the, what is art and beautiful magic and makes cards appear from thin air and just it's a real captivating moment and it's kind of the joy of a show like the illusionist is it's peaks and troughs and it's you get um this and then that and then this and then you sit back and watch this thing and then you're on the edge of your seat and you're tense at this thing is how long he's going to stay in the water tank and then oh, suddenly magic dave's doing a thing with some kids and then i'm coming on reading minds and looking ridiculous and you kind of constantly um you know it's kind of like a old school variety show but with just the variety of the world of magic and then we come together and do big tricks at the beginning and the end and it's uh yeah it's kind of always i'm always slightly annoyed that i'm in the show because i always say it's a show i'd like to watch well, didn't you get to watch when, I guess it's not did, even when you yes. were in the show, but when you were training replacement in Reno, didn't you get to be in the audience? I got to bit? watch two shows um, and it was very weird. It was great. <laughs> um, uh, Wes, who uh, does, who's kind of, kind of my understudy, um, you know, watching him and then seeing him from on video, being back in London and getting him to send me video and seeing him grow into that, that world is, uh, yeah, it was amazing. It's um, a very weird thing to do and really difficult because I was training him while doing the show mm -hmm. and kind of I write my material and then I get it on stage and it goes through all these changes in the moment and then you find these new things and but you never really analyze why you do them and suddenly I'm analyzing the act and then doing the act and it, it was a real it really screwed in my mind but um oh. yeah it was, uh, it was it was a fun it was a weird thing it was a real out-of-body experience to watch someone else do it yeah, well, you were a good teacher. It was definitely weird in the beginning because I'm imagining all of your quirks and everything like that. And I mean, you and Wes are totally different people, but you were a great teacher. I mean, he killed it um, filling in for you. So that was awesome. That was and the then weird one thing, actually, is to go mm -hmm. like, is, like you said, it's like I didn't want him just to copy me. And we had to find <laughs> his version of my character, which worked for him and worked for the, mm -hmm. the effects and the tricks and the routine. And the, yeah, he did an amazing job at it. He had like the awkwardness down to a T. Like, I know it's just kind of, it's part of his amazing personality, but it was funny because you're so like outgoing and I mean, you don't care what you say. And he like, if people were reacting awkwardly to him, he was just like, all right, like <laughs> this is an awkward moment. And he would say that and like, it was hilarious. So definitely two different amazing mind readers in the both of you. And then finally, just because I know um, we're kind of running out of time, but there was one thing when I was going through your site and when you were in Reno, we never really talked about your career that much. I feel like I saw you so much on stage that we were kind of avoiding magic when we did talk, but I saw you wrote and produced Hugh Jackman's Wolverine the Musical. Like, how was that never brought up in the months that all of us were together? Like, that's insane. It's, um, to preface it, it's not a full musical, it's just a short, like, uh, two minute thing that, um, so before I would do magic full time, I was doing magic and reading minds and also producer at a radio station called BBC Radio 1, which is the UK's biggest youth radio station, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the show I produced, we had had guests in, and, um, one of our guests one day was Hugh Jackman, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna write a musical for him and see if he'll sing it as part of the on-air feature, and, uh, and he did, and he, he was said very kind words about it and thought it was really funny and there's still a video on YouTube and you can see me sniggering in the background and it was like 9 a.m in the morning and I had Hugh Jackman going oh, that was really good well done um it was kind of you know the joy of that it's kind of leads into the stuff I do in magic in that you have stupid ideas and be like all right well let's just do this um, yeah. and that's kind of my career really is I have a stupid idea and go all right well, let's do it <laughs> that's so cool though and I know you've done a ton of different show appearances Hugh Jackman obviously is an amazing, just also so one well of the nicest story. human beings in the world. Just That's what so he seems nice. like. Aww. Like and also like at Radio One, I was lucky enough 
it's from I was there for a long time, and you name someone famous, I would probably met them. So it's like I remember, like for twenty minutes, was sat next to Beyonce on the floor holding a microphone for her because the mic stand had broken. And I was like, all right, well, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> and you know, I met low, you know, everyone. And Hugh Jackman stands out with a couple of other people as just the nicest human being. He made the effort to say hello to everyone who's in, you know, like every person working on the show. He he had no entourage with him. He just came on a bike that he borrowed from his hotel. He was just yeah, just exactly what you're hoping to be. Oh, and I was going to ask, obviously, that's an amazing story with Hugh Jackman, but was there another person, celebrity, whoever it may be, that you performed for and you were like, not necessarily starstruck, but you were like, oh my gosh, I like need to be perfect for this person? Um, there's, uh, there was one show in New York where, rumor had it, Neil Patrick Harris was going to be there. So I was like, really, like, oh, oh God. And then, so I did like, I was like, and it wasn't a great show because I was a bit nervous about the fact he was in. And then it turns out he wasn't there. So I was like, oh, great. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but equally, like, we had uh, um, Javier Bardem and Penelope Cruz came to see the show in London. Um, and it's always a bit weird. Like, I don't really, I, since then, I don't like to know if people are in because it throws me off my game a bit. I overthink it too much. But, you know, I've been lucky. Like, Ricky Gervais has always been a good fan of my work from when mm -hmm. I was very early starting it he gave me a quote for my first poster and you know hearing someone who I admire so much as a comedian and getting him to do his like a squawky bird laugh that he does and <laughs> him to do that because I've said something funny is a is, yeah you know th those moments are amazing um but also it's just like nice to I you know I I, I have a love-hate relationship with magic I don't like the showy off side of it like I rarely perform magic outside of doing a show Mm -hmm. um but when i do and people want to see it it's why i forget it's nice to kind of share that with people because people do really enjoy it so have you ever done anything not in a show like with your family or friends or are they like oh we'll just see it on stage or do or they um, like perform when i first started very much because that's the only way i could practice really um now it's rare that i do anything it's like if i'm working on an idea or something i might be like oh can i show you this little thing it's like these virtual shows i would um call up friends on zoom and be like hey can i show you something i'm working on and would kind of workshop the shows and have like little audiences and perform bits um because the only way to really know if stuff's going to work is to do it mm -hmm. um but inevitably not like if we're like if i'm out having dinner with stuff it's like it's it's weird because it's very much my job and there are mm -hmm. magicians who I, I kind of cringe a little bit when I see them out and they're like doing tricks and it's like, Oh, I prefer just to be a person and have a conversation rather than feel like I have to perform. And yeah. um, it can be like a social crutch for some people. And, and also I kind of feel like I don't want to watch a magic trick. I mean, I forget <laughs> people do, but I'm like, oh, that's the last thing I want to do. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a weird one. And I, I never want to say, I'm not someone who's like, I'm not doing anything. If someone specifically asked me to do something, I'll of course do it, but I'm mm -hmm. never really going to be someone who goes like, hey, can I show you a trick? Um, yeah. Because I prefer to say, hey, let's have a conversation. Totally. And I think it's the same with like me in sports. I mean, nobody asks players, hey, can you go like randomly as ground foul ball or ground a field a ground ball for me? It's yeah. really, I cannot put sentences together this morning. <laughs> But um, yeah, so finally, just I know you're doing virtual shows now, which is great because uh, my story time is so lucky to be listened to. I think we hit 18 countries so Amazing. far. So everybody now around the world can listen and interact with Chris Cox. How can they um, find out more information about your virtual shows and follow you on social media? Okay, so you need a thing called the internet. Um, it's a new invention, but if you uh, Google it, you'll discover what the internet is. Um, you can uh, magiccox.com, uh, C-O-X, uh, spell it correctly, like Courtney, not the other thing. Uh, that's or um, at Big Cox on Twitter or Magic Cox on Instagram or facebook.com slash I love Cox. Really, really spell those carefully. Um, you'll find out all about what I'm doing there. Um, and if you want to book me for a private show, I am very much available. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for the time. It was so great to see you again. I know we were saying it's been over a year. So to see your face again is amazing. So thank you. So uh, much. Likewise, thank you for having me and letting me talk about my favorite subject, which is me.